Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast sponsored by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Hugh Seaton. He is the author of the Construction Technology Handbook, which is all about digital technology for construction, going from the ground up to understand and master modern construction software tools, robotics, AI, and more. Hugh has been involved in contact for over a decade and brings a wealth of knowledge. Welcome to the show, Hugh. Thanks, Todd. Good to be here. Yeah. So let's start with how you got into the construction industry. So uh, about a little bit more than a, a decade ago, I was in China. Um, I spent a lot of my, my early career there and uh, I was building websites and doing some other things. And a friend said, hey, can you help me with this BIM business I'm, I'm taking from India into China. Uh -huh. So it's an American guy taking Indian, Indian services into the Chinese market, because why wouldn't he? It's a guy named Paul Doherty, who you may have heard of. Yeah. Um, so Paul and I got started. He was working. He was, he was president of a company focused on BIM, but also using BIM as a management tool. So this is 11 years ago. It was pretty advanced for what was going for, you know, where the world was then. Uh -huh. That kind of, it was really cool because being in the middle of China that was building everything all the time and talking to someone about some of the design technologies that go into it, I was really exciting. Uh, about a year and change after that, we created the AEC Hackathon. One about two years after that, we created the AEC Hackathon. So Paul and a guy named Damon Hernandez mm -hmm. created this hackathon. That's now they've done I don't know fifty of them around the world. And I was there for one of, for the first two, and then did one in New York, and then we did one in Shanghai. And it just really got more and more exciting for me. And along the way, I was doing other things, some writing, some some of this and that. Um, middle of uh, 2016, I created a company that did VR and AR, but also did um, used voice and AI or AI voice rather for some construction applications. And that really kind of supercharged and got me into it. Yeah. The business plan for that is what turned into the book actually. Cause as I was doing it, I'm like, this thing is brutal. It's like writing a book and I'm like, bucket list. Right, so, write a book now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. I mean, I spent another couple of years kind of getting it together, but yeah, that's how, that's kind of how I got into it. And, and it's just an amazing industry. The, the more you get into it and meet people and um, the more you see what people are building, uh, the more you, the more you get excited about it, at least for me. Oh yeah. I mean, the, there's so much potential going on in construction right now. I, that's what gets me excited about the industry. Uh, so I'd love to hear the, the process about writing the book. So you mentioned it, it kind of spun out of a business plan, but you know, how, how that process look for you in writing the book? So I got, uh, I got really lucky around the time I made up my mind to do it. Um, a friend introduced me to somebody who was kind of like a, a, a staff writer for Wiley in that he's done a lot of books through, not really a staff writer, but he's got a great relationship with them. Uh -huh. He will ghostwrite for some people and he writes his own books. But so he, I don't know how many, it's like 30 books. So he, they really know him and they really trust him. Yeah. So when he introduced me, I got, I got a pretty good hearing. Um, and they said, sure, you know, give yourself some time, which of course I underestimated how long I would need. Um, I probably spent two thirds of the roughly nine months that I, I took to between signing the thing and, and writing it. I should also add, it wasn't just a meeting. There's a, there's a process you do um, for a book proposal. It's a pretty standard way of doing things. And it actually looks more like a mini business plan than it does a creative document. You're, you're saying, here's what I'm going to do. And here's what else is out there. And Wiley does a lot in construction. So that was easy. Uh -huh. um, and here's who's going to buy it, which, you know, you hope. Uh, and here's what I'm going to do to support it. And some conversations like this are part of supporting it. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'll be honest with you, I had no idea how to, how to take the, the ideas in my head and turn them into something that was coherent. And I, it wasn't coherent. It was too big. In the beginning, it was like, oh, AEC technology. And I'm going to talk about this. And I'm like, okay, first of all, BIM has been done really, really, really well. Um, so the design side of it, I was less, I said, well, we leave BIM alone. I, I mentioned it in the book, but honestly, if you're interested in really understanding BIM, there are some people that have written entire books that are, that are fantastic. Um, so yeah, the, I, spent some, I spent about five months or so taking, taking this much and turning it into this much so that you can have chapters that don't 
overwhelm people. There's a saying yeah. in, in, uh, in, in writing where they say, don't make the reader suffer for your research. <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the process was that, was figuring out how to write. And, you know, if, for anyone who's interested, there's a book called how to, on, on Writing Well by a guy named William Zinser. Fantastic. Really, really good. And his main point is don't use adjectives you don't need. Don't be flowery because you're not that good at it. And the people that are, are, are you're not them. Um, try to be straight and, and just tell your story in English. And, and, you know, usually a couple of grades below the reader. So it's easy for them. It's smooth and fluent for them to read. That's actually pretty awesome. When someone tells you not to try to be Hemingway and just to tell your story, it's, it's pretty freeing because then you stop trying to be Hemingway. You just tell your story. So Right. Um, yeah, it takes a lot yeah, of that pressure off. It did. It did. Um, yeah, then, then after that, once I kind of had it, had the chapters more or less in my mind, I wrote them. And of course, what ended up being the chapters is nothing like what I thought they were, but at least it was good enough as a roadmap to start driving. Um, I had this one moment when it was about three weeks from being due when I, I was just losing my mind. I'm like, I'm never going to do this. I, I, I called the, the, uh, the uh, publisher and said, hey, I, I need more time. And he he was so fast to say yes. My guess is he probably in his own mind gave me three more months and was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what like, I mean? Oh, this is the first guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He has more. no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's, the funny thing is, and this is true about a lot of things. Once you kind of, the, the dam broke, it was easy mm -hmm. to write the rest of it. And, and I was pretty much on time. So nice. Yeah. I can imagine once it, the hardest thing is, is just getting started and figuring out kind of the right. angle that you wanted to take. And, and, and you don't know the process yet. Like you don't, you don't know how to write a book and I'm not sure I do now either, but I certainly know better. Right. So, you know, I didn't even know where to start. I didn't, I mean, do you go right in and start writing, which is no, you shouldn't. I mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't write. You should just shouldn't write as if this is going to be the end. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. I probably wrote the book two and a half times in terms of stuff I just threw out and yeah. Yeah. So uh, talk to me about your, your research and, uh, I understand you, you went through a lot of different conversations with people throughout the industry to, uh, you know, get different perspectives on that. What was that like? It, it was amazing, actually. It's a, one of the things I mentioned earlier. It's just, a, it's an industry with a lot of pretty great people in it. Mm -hmm. um, so in the beginning, I said to Paul, actually, I said, hey, I'm going to write a book. He said, great, call these people. Then I talked to a friend of mine, Cody Nowak on the West Coast. And, and Cody said, oh, dude. <laughs> and next thing you know, I had like 40 people to call. I think it's even more than that. So I, in the end, I probably spoke to a hundred, maybe more. Wow. Um, I, everything from, you know, I would go on LinkedIn because I wanted to talk to folks that were superintendents and I didn't know any. Mm -hmm. um, and like, oh my God, everyone was sure, sure. I, I probably spoke to 10 or I don't even know. I don't even know. Um, just to get a sense of what daily life is like and, and you know, kind of get grounded. But the same thing is I talked to people at the, you know, kind of Autodesk research, like the other end of the, of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, and they were awesome too. Not always, it, it turned out to not really wind up being useful, but the point is there was a, a, an interest and generosity in the industry. I thought that was really nice. And, and there's a sense among the people I spoke to that we're on a path of, of getting better and, and improving the industry and, and you know innovating and moving forward that I thought people were pretty excited about and frustrated because of course everyone thinks their industry is the dumbest, slowest, least innovative. This is true of everybody though. I worked in advertising, they thought the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I worked in e-learning and they thought the same thing and they were they were a little more right. But uh, so everybody thinks their industry is full of idiots and, <laughs> and they're not. The they're idiots not make right. the world go round. You know? you know what I mean? Like like I think there was a movie about that. No, but the, but the reality is that, that it's hard to change and it's hard to, uh, everything you do has other impacts and it's, sure. you know, it's, you can't change the way you do, I don't know, BIM coordination without changing the way you buy things, without changing your legal exposure with, you know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. It's a domino impacts. effect on everything. That's right. Yeah. So it, it, it's slow. Yeah. What were some of the kind of the, the biggest advantages or the, you know, compelling points that got people excited around contact that you found when you were talking with people and researching the book? I think that there's a few things. One is um, some people don't care because they, they shouldn't, it's, that's not, that doesn't like their vote. So it yeah. doesn't like their, doesn't like their fire. It doesn't float their boat, me and my metaphors. Um, other people though, liked gear. Like you think about what construction's about. It's about tools and making stuff and figuring things out and, and doing it better than you did last time or 
figuring out a clever way of solving a problem. Well, technology is just a set of tools. That's actually one of the main points of the book. So you already have people who are biased towards liking tools and liking making stuff. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? And, and mm-hmm. now you give them tools that, that are cool, that do like visual stuff and, you know, automatic this and automatic that. And, and, you know, and I don't know if you know Jonathan Marsh. He's, um, he's yeah. out of Pennsylvania. He, he for me, is, is like an example of like the, the ultimate example of what I mean. He, he gets all this stuff. He, he decides he wants to learn code. So he goes and learns to code. He decides he wants to learn how to draw. And now he draws. He's a blacksmith. I mean, like I said, he's, a, he's kind of at the, at the far end of a general point, which is it's, the, it's an industry loaded with people that like to use tools to make stuff. And they liked, a lot of people like the idea that technology is going to allow them to do the thing they love to do just faster and, and remove some of the, 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 the process that's involved that isn't the fun part. You know what I mean? Like yeah. scheduling is, is thinking about a schedule is fun. Actually putting a schedule down on paper, I'm like, you know, it's not the most fun part. You know what I mean? Like thinking right. about we're going to do this, then wait, we can't do that. We can do this. That's the part that people kind of enjoy, or at least some people do. Because they're 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 creating and they're they're solving problems, but the tools that solve problems, it's nice if you don't have to throw out a piece of paper because you made a mistake, and that's right. what digitizing does. Yeah, well, that automation and the the digitizing, as you you mentioned just there, that's the, I mean, that's the whole promise of technology of allowing you to kind of give up those aspects of the job so that it frees you up to do the more creative aspects and the the more strategic thinking that is is the more fun part of the job. Anyway, that's right. Yeah. My day job, I would be remiss not to mention is working at CSI on their crosswalk product. Yeah. Um, and one of the, it, it does that too. It's actually why I, t- I took the job. Like the story is awesome. My, my boss is a guy named Rick Balkum and he's been involved in, in uh, IT for a long time and he's built a bunch of stuff. And he and I were talking about something unrelated and, and he said, Hey, you know, we've got the guy who built the, the API is moving on. He's, he was, I mean, unbelievable dude, but, but not, not so much a product manager as a sort of CIO build it super like with tickets and support and all this other stuff, but the feature development side, they're like, look, we're, we're looking to have someone do that. And it was so, it's so funny. We're ta- he's like, so if you know anybody, and I guess something on my face, he said, oh, or you, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, yeah, and I was like, in, coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, it's and um, and I was at a job that that was great. It was the you know VR AR company in in New York, but wasn't able to kind of explore the construction side of things as much as I wanted, and the timing was just right for some other reasons. And within four days, I was I was signed up. So really fast, just nice. crazy. Yeah, because again, it's it's doing it's doing some of what we're talking about. It's removing some of the BS. And you know what classifies as what, and oh my God, I got it in master format. How do I do the, the Unicode and whatever? And, and it automates some of that, which is fun. Yeah, that's not meant to be a product plug. It's just saying that it 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 shows up in in that some of the stuff that I found and some of the things I like about where the industry's going, show up in what I do every day, which is which is always good. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, Better so, than gardening. <laughs> well, circling back on one of the things that you just said uh, is is making the technology the tool and you know comparing it to it's just really no different than any other tool that a construction site uses pairing that along with getting people more comfortable in adopting technology what are some ways that you go about uh, kind of helping increase that comfortability yeah, that's that's a um, that's a great question. So there, one thing I would say is there's a guy named uh, Stephen Kuhn, I think it was, who wrote a book on on scientific revolutions, and and his he makes this amazing point up front, and he says digital technologies are different because they, we can't see how they work. So most mm-hmm. technologies that aren't digital, there's physics involved, and you can see that you know the thing's rotating into the wall. It's a it's a drill. I get it. Mm-hmm. Digital technology, all the magic happens in, in, you know, on, a, on a silicon chip, so you can't see it. So yeah. it does take a minute for people to make the leap to not needing to see how the thing works, but being okay with inputs, then outputs, but not the, not the engine itself. So that, that's it. And I kind of get into that in the beginning of the book um, when I think, when I talk about what, what is a technology. And all a technology is, is, is a formal way of applying science. You can get more complicated than that, but that's a nice start. 
Um, the, the way I, I, I did two things that were kind of at the same time. I, I did a couple of courses with Procore and that was just me talking to Sasha Reed and saying, hey, I keep hearing people say nobody gets data and I might do a course. And I knew they did some courses and she said, that's a great idea. Let's do five. <laughs> so we did, so we'd, and you know, her team were amazing and they, they, they did the production. I did the writing and we were during COVID. So trying to figure out how to shoot in a totally not good for camera place in Connecticut was just, was a whole other thing. But that and the book were, were both, especially the first half of the book, were both trying to do the same thing. And that is to speak to people as if you were having a beer with them about mm -hmm. what these things are. So they don't have to ask. So you don't have to say, hey, what's an API? Now everybody will know, right? And, and what is, how do we think of data? What's data good for? That's what the mm -hmm. data courses did. And I, the book did it a little bit, but the courses really kind of cover it. So the idea of, of just speaking to people in straight English about what this thing is without them having to ask, so they can be part of the conversation. Like the goal isn't that you're making someone in the field or someone who's you know been around a long time say yes to things. It's say yes or no based on feeling good about it, not just being, yeah, I don't want to deal with it. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. The no talk is, down is it, when you're trying to do a new software. You don't have to... You know, and I, I like that common English. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you don't have to be fancy with it. This is set the expectations right, and this is what it does, and this is how it benefits you. That's right. And also, though, I mean, knowing you know what an API is, or knowing what a, an agile sprint is, can it, they're not very complex ideas. But if you haven't heard them before, you, you're missing half the conversation. So giving somebody the vocabulary is is you know that's kind of the point. And then. You know, later on, I talk about what AI, how AI is really done, and that most of it is is math. Like it's just math. It's not magic. It's not human. We shouldn't be comparing it to humans because that's totally misleading. We should say this is awesome software. This isn't, you know, really really narrow humans. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. just when you see pictures of robots when someone's talking about, you know, an algorithm that can recognize dogs. Come on. You know what I mean? Oh, our, our, our robot overlords, they can do one thing, but they can, they can recognize the hell out of a dog, but they can't do another thing. So that was the other part is to try to talk about the limits of, of some of this stuff. You know, it, it can do great things and it can automate stuff and save labor and, you know, keep you from making mistakes and all that stuff. But it doesn't get near what a human into an experienced human can do. The intuition, the context, the problem solving, the creativity, there's no soft, we don't even know how to build. It's not a question of, oh, you know, in a couple of years, we'll get there. We don't know how to do that. There's no architecture. There's no theory, none of it. Right. So, we're, you know, these are great tools, but that's it. They're not, they're not taking your job and they're not taking over. Yeah. So the AI robots aren't, uh, aren't coming from the future to take over everything right now. Yeah, who knows in 20 years, maybe, you know, but I, I, there's, my point is, you know, we just had this happen. You remember in 2018 or so, everyone was like, oh yeah, man, autonomous vehicles are coming in 2019. And I used to get on like Facebook, people would, would slam me when I was like, let's take it easy. Yeah. Um, well, it's 2021 and you can't. There's a couple of routes in Phoenix that apparently people in Phoenix don't love because it stops all the time. <laughs> the AI, when in doubt, it stops, which is probably a good response. So my point is, you know, it, it, we thought it would be this long and it's really going to be longer. And I think that's right. going to be true for, for really hard stuff. It, it, yeah. We just don't know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of goes into, you know, setting the expectation game. And I think when the, a trap that people fall into all too often when rolling out new technology is their expectations are way off base and they're expecting the software to you know, be the silver bullet that cures every problem known to man but that's that's just not fair <laughs> to any software uh, how do you go about setting those right expectations to really yeah, embracing I, it yeah i think the first thing you want to do is remember that software is doing things that humans do badly really well mm. but a lot of things that we do really well it doesn't do at all uh -huh. and that's important because you 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 know you you make assumptions like humans are really forgiving if we can do something, we can probably do it when the, when it's dimmer or when there's less information or when it's faster or whatever. We're pretty flexible in, 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 in our ability to do skills. Computers are not, software is not. Mm -hmm. So you get edge cases that just kill you. So, so you know what I mean? Like yeah. I built this so that it would work. Uh, I don't, I'm making it up, but it would work, you know, in about taxes. 
it, it, but as soon as I try to use the thing that I built for taxes to do budgets, it's not built for it and breaks. Right. You know what I mean? Or somebody comes into my, you know, I built something for taxes and somebody is an entrepreneur who also has some investments and also has, you know, some, some rem and B transactions for like, it, it's, it's, that's an, it's an edge case that it's not going to work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think you set expectations by saying the main thing that we demoed is probably going to work really well, but in the field, you're going to have to know that you can't, you can't expect it to be flexible because it won't. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a great uh, illustration of that, that flexibility. I hadn't thought about that of that's really probably where all the frustration comes in with because hundred percent. Oh yeah. People were flexible. and like, well, if to use the tax and budget thing, that's similar. You can use the yeah. same processes, but the software, if it's designed for the one, it, it's not going to do the other. It's got no ability. Well. No, it's got, and we talk about, you know, AI as, as being able to learn, but not really. It's able to take in data and change its models, which is kind of learning, but not learning like we think of where we see a new thing and we, we sort of squint and figure it out. There's yeah. no squinting and figuring out. There's just getting more accurate. Like really it's not learning. It's just getting more accurate. Like that's what machine learning does is whatever you're training it to do, it'll get more accurate. And that is a form of learning, but not like we mean like new skill acquisition or recognizing something totally new. There's, there's, there, you know, there's things on the edge that they're playing around with. And when somebody gets on stage to do a, 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 a keynote, they'll bring up goofy examples that don't illustrate anything. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, oh, there's a company in, in, in Silicon Valley who's make, who's using robots to make pizza. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Okay, but they've just sunk, and God bless them. I, there is a company doing that, and they're they're re- doing relatively. It doesn't illustrate anything. It just means somebody spent money to make a robot that can <laughs> make pizza pour, and why pour, not? Pour <laughs> sauce. But yeah, exactly. It doesn't mean that bricklayers all of a sudden have to worry. You yeah. know what I mean? It doesn't mean that that. So, because the other thing is, a human could walk into that kitchen and then walk into another kitchen and make pizza in both. That kitchen is the pizza maker. So the same thing is true, like with robots on job sites, the problem with that is uneven ground and you got a problem. Lighting changes, you got a problem. Too much wind, you got a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. You get a brick in there that's not, that, that doesn't, that has a crack in it, but it, it isn't broken in half. You probably have a problem. So the reality is that that really regular stuff, like like there's this really fun one that ta- that does rebar tying. Have you seen this? This robot that, that'll, and it's, it's like this massive truss and it's not for irregular shapes, but if you've got, you know, I don't know, 100,000 square foot floor, it's perfect because you just yeah. put it on the end and, it, and it'll go. And that's the stuff people absolutely love, right? It's, it's tying one after, I'm, I'm joking. They automated like the worst, one of the worst jobs, right? But it's, it's they're still going to need people to do it. It's just, they've automated a piece. Yeah, interesting. I heard recently somebody talk about the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. And efficiency is is getting the job done really fast, and then effectiveness is doing the right things well. And that makes me think of that. The the technology is good at an AI at, at getting more efficient and figuring out what are those little things that we can cut out of this process to streamline it. And then effectiveness, humans do that well because they can be flexible and go well let's you know pair this and let's go in this direction and this is kind of that higher level strategy aspect of it comes into play then that's right and you think about it as a as the sorcerer's apprentice is another kind of uh, analogy is is ai will keep running and it but it may it won't know if it's the right direction Right. This is the biggest thing. So when you hear people that really understand AI and build it for a living and all that, they'll often tell you robot overlords aren't what we should be worried about. Trusting it to have sense when it doesn't and, and, and giving it more control than, it, than it's ready for is the bigger deal. So if we put AI in charge of an, of an electric grid, now I'm in, I'm in Austin, Texas, so I'm not sure humans are, this is the best example in the world because you know, it's been a rough month. It's been a rough, <laughs> been a rough couple of weeks. Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. But, but the point is that, you know, you put AI in charge of a mission critical thing like that, you don't know what it's going to miss because it had the data you trained it on wasn't enough. And humans do this too. It's just humans will often self-doubt and, and gut check. And there's just no, right now, you got to be careful about, about whether AI is going to gut check or not. Yeah. Interesting. Well, how do you simplify the technology landscape out in construction as more contact tools and apps and everything is, is coming online daily. So it's funny, I, I, you know, every quarter I do this thing, the construction technology quarterly. And the goal of that 
is to, pre- to create. And in, in three weeks, I'm going to relaunch the actual directory. Uh-huh. So I pulled together as many um, construction tech companies as I could find. It was about 500. And now there's more, but not, not a ton more. So in all, there's, there's maybe a thousand products out there, which sounds like a lot until you break it into pieces. That was the point. The point is, if you're looking for estimating software, there's like 15. That's not so bad. Mm-hmm. And it isn't, there isn't a new estimating software coming out every week. There's a new thing coming out every week, but not a new estimating software. So yeah. the reality is that whoever you are, unless you're the, unless you're the CIO of you know, DPR, in which case, you, you, but then you've got a team to chew, to chew through that stuff for you. Right. You're, you're not seeing a ton of, ton of new stuff. You're seeing one, a new thing once in a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so so the, what I did to simplify it is, is that, is to, to say, all right, let's gather everything we can find and put it in one place. So it isn't some like black cloud of, you know, app fatigue. It's like, okay, there's 500 pro- companies in there. If you add up all their products, as I say, it was something like a thousand. Um, but when I slice it in, Project management software, not surprisingly, is insane. And job site management, depending on how you want to define it, there's like, but that's like 50. It's still not that bad. You know what I mean? And you can knock out the ones that that you're probably not going to want because they're a little more focused on oil and gas or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a crazy number. Um, It is actually a great thing that there's all this interest. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people because I'm writing another little paper and I'm doing a thing on supply chain, whatever. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of smart people in this industry that are trying to figure it out. There's, you know, the, con- the contractors you talk to are doing more than they're often talking about because they don't want to run around and say, hey, we tried a thing and it failed. But they're, they're actively, actively innovating. Uh, some of it's just going to help their superten- superintendents do a better job. Some of it's going to turn out to be stuff you see. Some of it's going to be, it doesn't work. And you know what? We spent a couple bucks and figured it out. So I don't know. I, I, I kind of got aside from your question about simplification. For me, it's break it into pieces. Yeah. Break, it into, break it into categories you care about. And then you're going to be like, well, it's not so bad. You know? yeah. uh, I think that's a good tip. Uh-huh. What are some misconceptions that are kind of built around contact that really aren't true? That people are slower to adopt than other places. Like, look, you go to you go to Facebook, and obviously they're going to be a little bit, you know, kind of leaning forward on technology. Uh-huh. Um, but you know, a lot of them also, a lot of people that work at Facebook as software developers grow grapes on the weekend and are super low tech in their in their daily life. But that's another story. I, I've seen people in, you know, I've worked at Sony in the, around 2000, and it, it, we that was a kind of a shift towards digital from analog uh-huh. and that took longer and and sony still isn't really there like that's why no one talks about the walkman anymore because they never really understood digital content now owning a owning you know owning a, a, a music company and owning a a, 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 a a a theater company or whatever movie movie studio probably didn't help but nevertheless they didn't get it and these yeah. were very smart people with many millions in, in research budget, more than, more than uh, construction companies. You know, same thing in advertising. Advertising got absolutely walloped in the middle of the 2000s. And, and lots of people lost their jobs and whatever. Um, but they weren't any faster to adopt new technology. If anything, they were in some ways slower. So this misconception that, that, so, that construction is so slow is missing some of the point. I think that people walk in and have sometimes the wrong benefit. So everyone got all wound up about the productivity thing because the McKinsey article, mm-hmm. which was actually really valuable because it woke people up. But most of the time people are using software to solve the problem in front of them. And it's hard to think about productivity on an individual. It ultimately does work and ladder up. The people are more worried about good documentation and winning and winning disputes than they are necessarily about making people work better. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so I think that, that often it gets, the adoption question gets put in the wrong terms. Um, I also think that, that, you know, you've got people that are, have a lot going on, like it, it's messy on a job site and there's a lot of things going on and there's a lot of stuff you got to worry about and this and that. So there is less um, uh, appetite for letting it, letting us figure it out. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Give them the space uh, to make it work. That's right. And there really isn't time to say, can you take two hours after lunch and go figure this new thing out? 
Whereas in an, in an office environment, that's not crazy is I'm just going to block off two hours and not do meetings. Mm -hmm. Harder to do on a job site when, when it's, it's almost laughable how many moving parts there are. Right. So, so I think the idea that, that people are, are, are inherently anti-technology is kind of silly. Um, of course, some people are, but that's true of any, any group of people. Um, in contrast, I think it's the opposite. I think that there's, there's, there, there's a, uh, like I said earlier, these are tools. And if you present them as that, and you present them as removing barriers between you and the stuff you love, which is putting work in place and solving the problem, um, people are, are all over it. Um, no. I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about adoption of some things like uh, Procore was one and reality captures another. And people love it because it, it tends to move obstacles out of the way, uh, especially when they get the UI right, when they get the user interface right, and it's not asking someone with gloves on to do, so, you know, to, to type a lot. Uh, you know what I mean? Like actually yeah. speaking to people in the field about how they want to do their jobs is, you know, pe but people are doing that now. I think they weren't. I think 10 years ago, you had a problem that uh, there was a lot of folks, you know, taking accounting software and, and making a, a field version of it. And it, so it wasn't something... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to use accounting. I mean, taxes are coming up, and I'm already stressing about TurboTax, and it's, it's like stupid easy. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, this sure. is a thing about accounting software. So my point is, uh, people are getting pretty good at, at talking to folks in the field and and um and really doing the product management thing they're supposed to do. And I'm not sure so sure that was true ten years ago. Yeah, you know, I think to your point, I don't think people are as much anti-technology as they are just anti-change, and that's just human you know it goes across all industries people are reluctant to change what they know you know doing something different is inherently risky because what if it fails yeah and especially in construction people don't like to fail well and risk and trust are a bigger deal in construction than they are in a lot of other places you know sure. i mean like the, the the contract structure pushes risk all over the place and you know people mess around with documents to kind of move risk around so there's definitely a a risk thing, and that kind of that kind of leads to some trust issues on occasion, um, which definitely slows things down, especially on the change front. Um, but you know, on the other hand, that maybe that's why now is the time for technology and construction, because for us for a startup to go out with a really solid product is so much easier than it was five years ago, and much less ten or fifteen years ago. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can you can build on a cloud platform. And, and have your ducks in a row and have your security sorted out and have pieces that they already have that you can pull together. Then you write your magic sauce in there and you've got a product. You know, if you had to grow that all from scratch, which I've, I've done, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's a, and you, you miss stuff because it's just one or two people banging away on a keyboard. So I think the other side of it is that the, the, the trustworthiness of modern software is just a different class from where it was before in terms of breaking and, you know, whatever. Yeah, um, sure. And that's, that's something I wish people understood more is that, is that the, the foundations you're building on are just so much more solid than, than they were because it's just, again, the cloud providers do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, expanding on that point too, and tying it back to what you were saying before, um, you know, I think that there's a messaging problem around technology and, and software and that people might see the benefit in the office and they get all excited, but it's a, a field technology inherently and they don't really communicate what's in it for the field guys. They just say, Hey, we are getting this new software. It's the greatest thing. Go implement it. But they don't take the time to really unpack why it's beneficial for the field. It may be awesome for the field and it may save a, a ton of time. It may, you know, create that efficiency and effectiveness that we were talking about. But if the people aren't getting that message out there to the end user and, and who's actually going to use it, that really hurts that, the, the buy-in and getting people excited about using it. Does that make sense? It does. It really does. And, and I think one of the one of the challenges of, of software and any any technology, but definitely software in construction is, you know, in, in, in software, there's a there's a word we use called um, uh, customer success, which mm -hmm. you obviously know, but just for the audience and customer success is what happens after the sale. It's, it's how do you help people to use it? And it kind of became important for SaaS. It wasn't so much before that. You didn't really hear this 10 years ago, but no. when you're using software as a service where people can turn it off or not use it, as opposed to buying a bunch of licenses for Microsoft. And even then it, you needed it, but you really need it now. And that is working with 
whoever it is that bought the software to make sure that not only do they use it, but they use it well, because mm -hmm. every software has 50 buttons in it. Um, and if you don't use it, you know, if you only use the, the, a little bit of it, you can ask yourself, is this worth the money? As opposed to, well, did you know it does this? But that's problem number one is, is just getting people to use it well. The second problem, and definitely the bigger one, is how do you get past the pilot team so that the company's using it or more units of the company, depending on how decentralized mm -hmm. they are. Lots of GCs are pretty good at this. So their innovation teams are pretty, pretty awesome. I've, I've been lucky enough to speak to some folks from some of the names, usually they don't want me to talk about it, but, but uh, and it, cause they're all, it's so funny. They're all doing amazing stuff, but they're kind of, you know. And they hold it close to the vest. <laughs> you know, I, they, I think they want to control the discussion. I, I, sure. I think they want to talk about stuff they're doing in the context that it saves the owner money, as opposed to we bought a bunch of drones and look how well it went. Um, which they yeah. all did. <laughs> and then and then finally drones are being valuable. But anyway, the point I'm making is the innovation teams now, a lot of these folks are really, really good at, at going out and finding stuff based on real problems their teams are having. And then once they've done a pilot, they'll package it and sell it internally, which is really hard for an outside company to do, although you can damn well support them while they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that part is, is way, it's a much bigger deal in construction than it is in most other company, in most other t uh, sectors. Because once, you know, once IT says we're doing this software, you kind of have it. And, mm -hmm. and that it's in, because it, everybody's, you know, using a laptop to do most of their job. So boom, I have a product. Whereas, you know, you can choose to use it or not when you're in the field. You know, at the end of the day, if the report, the daily report gets in the way they ask for it, who cares what else you did? Right. Um, so, you know, and that's that's true for a lot of this stuff. So I think that the customer success and internal adoption is a bigger deal. And people know that, though. And, and again, general contractors are, are very good at that. I can't speak as clearly about about um, mechanical and, and some trade, except I, I, I've, you know, Travis Voss will, will talk to you about what about how they manage internally. And he's done some pretty awesome stuff. Like he had a guy come in. I'm off topic a little, but I want to speak about how mechanical contractors are pretty badass too. And, and, and I can't oh, speak yeah. to electrical yet. Um, although Josh at Nika is doing some amazing stuff, but you know, he had someone come in and, and, and assess all their software and make sure it worked together. That's pretty good. Like that's, that's pretty thoughtful. And I, yeah. I think you're seeing big mechanical contractors really drive innovation in their, in their world. And the electrical, you know, the electrical contractors, I think you're going to see some innovation on the service side because they're the ones who can help you wire your low voltage together. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it's Josh, uh, uh, Josh Bone has some pretty awesome stuff to say about that. Cause, and I think he's right. I think that the future of electrical contracting, there'll be high voltage, but I think there's going to be a lot, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, I just bought all this gear. How do I make it work? Right. Yeah, I agree. MEP, there's a ton of innovators doing some really cool things and that are, are proud and they're out talking about it, like the Travis Vosses of the worlds. And, you know, anytime you, you listen to Josh, you can't help but get excited about <laughs> the future yeah. and where everything's going there. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, of course, the other, the other M, the M, the E, and the P, Mike Zivanovic, um, is it's funny, his focus is as much about about what my book is about. And he was he wrote the forward for it, but but really focusing on on um, thinking about being open to new ways of doing things for yeah. the, the pipe fitters. So I just had to do the full MEP or I wouldn't be, a pro I mean, I'm on the MEP uh, podcast. That's right. That's right. I like it. <laughs> gotta, We're gotta big represent. fans of the skilled trades over here. <laughs> got to represent. Uh, any kind of lessons learned from other industries on digital transformation that construction can learn from and get a little jump start? I think there's a, there's a couple. Um, one of them is, is the, actually this, I think it was Bill Gates who said this. We always overestimate how the change in the short term and underestimate the change in the long term. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that um, being an anxious about big disruptions in the short run is probably not worth the time. Mm -hmm. But preparing yourself for what's coming, especially if you're in your 30s or 20s, um, you know, you're going to be as much a technologist as you are a welder, as a, as a pipe fitter, as a, you know, bricklayer, whatever it is. You're going to be thinking in technology and getting past the fact that um, it, it may not have what you chose, may not have been the direction you chose when you were coming out of high school. It doesn't matter. These are the, this is the toolkit that allows you to do what you love doing. 
-hmm. which is putting work in place, hanging out with a, with a team of people that are doing it with you. If anything, the team part of it has, has gotten, you know, COVID kind of helped with that in terms of communication, um, but also being able to build better, awesome things you can point to. I mean, there's nothing better than building something and then driving by it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, so the lesson from other, other um, industries is you don't have to freak out, but you should think about what, what, what you want to prepare. Like, what do you want to go learn? at the pace you want to go learn it, but just get going. Mm -hmm. Whether that could be, you know, how to use no code tools. So a thing I'm really excited about now is you can build apps with no code. And it's, there's a bunch of stuff out there. All the cloud providers do it, but there's like bubble.io does this. There's a bunch of these. And if you're using Excel right now, you can make full blown apps. So if you're a small mechanical contractor and you want your app, your Excel to do things it can't do today, you can go learn in, you know, with a YouTube video how to make your own apps. And it's just pulling stuff together and, and playing around a little bit. It's just, there's no yeah, code at cool. all. Or you could learn, you could, you know, you could learn how to, how to write Python. If you, if you're feeling really ambitious, that's just, that's a bit of a commitment. Yeah. Uh, nice. I, I like the, uh, be cool and, and steady. Don't, don't freak out, but go take action. Yeah. I mean, they need what you can do now. If you're a, if you're a, a, a skilled trade, people need what the human can do now. The, the technology isn't coming for your job. It's yeah. not, it's what is coming for your job is the other guy who can do, who can work with these new tools. That's a bigger threat than, than robots. Mm. Bigger threat is some dude who, who went through, you know, Mike's classes at, at, uh, at, what's it called, at the UA in Chicago. Yeah. And this person can do Revit and they're a badass and, and you know, and you two are both being considered for a gig or considered for, for a, you know, for a contract and you'll be out competed. Sure. Again, I don't think that's happening tomorrow, but that's probably happening over time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, how do people get a hold of you, find out more about your book and your podcast as well? Yeah. So just go to hughseaton.com. I put it all there. Well, that's uh, simple. You can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got one more question for you. Uh, what does innovation mean to you? So for me, innovation is, is thinking about how things are done as concretely as possible to do them better. So it isn't creativity, it's, it's, a, it's applying creativity to do real things better uh, in a concrete way, not, not in a, kind of one of the problems with it, the term innovation is it gets often used for very high level, airy, you know, yeah. goofy thing. And, and it matters if it's changing how people do things. Otherwise, it's not really innovation. It's just a story. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, I asked all my guests that and uh, uh, I always love the, the answers that, that come back. Did they all stammer like I just did? You think it's so easy and it, it's not. And I never get the same answer, which is great. Yeah. You want to answer it well. So you think about, you think about it for a minute, but. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, Hugh, thanks so much for coming on and, and talking with us. Really appreciate it. My, my pleasure.